Praise the Lord. We continue on the Faith for the Rapture series. And uh, we did talk, talk about something about the Melchizedek generation. Because our focus in this faith series is to learn and acquire the gift of faith that God has for us in the generation of the end times. So let's once again welcome the Holy Spirit and reach out to God our Father who so much want to bless us each day, each hour, and each minute. Father, we come before you once again. Because the ministry of your word is awesome. We may preach a million sermons, but each sermon is an awesome word that we handle carefully. For your word make heaven and earth. By this word of God, that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. And these words that your spirit is bringing forth is vital to this end time generation. And we ask of God that your spirit of wisdom, revelation, love, peace and joy will arise upon each one of our hearts, will come upon each one of our hearts, to make our hearts a fertile ground. That your word of faith, faith for this end time, faith for the rapture, faith to walk in the seventh heaven relationship, to walk in the Holy of Holies until our lives dwell in the Holy of Holies. We ask the Father God that this word of yours will come forth sharp as a two-edged sword that it would light up our heart and our spirits, that you would impart faith to each one of us, that you will cause us to come to the knowledge of salvation to the fullness, so that our spirit, soul and body are preserved blameless under the coming of Jesus Christ, without spot, without blemish, and that we be transformed by looking into the glory of your word. And your word reveals your image and all of your presence. Establish your word in our lives. Confirm your word as it goes forth with signs and wonders. Bring healing, both restoration healing and creating miracles through your word. We ask for God as we sit in your presence, touch our spirit, souls and body afresh. And glorify your son Jesus again. Lift him high. That we may be lost in the presence and the consciousness of Jesus. We ask Father God that Jesus be glorified. For we can do nothing without Jesus. And it's in him we live and move and have our being. Thank you Father for all that you do. And we give you all the glory, worship and honor. Jesus name and everyone say Amen Well, let's pick up from where we left all this morning and for those who are not here Yes We'll restart the live stream and uh, while he's restarting let's all rise and sing on song of worship Amen. Thank you Jesus we worship you. <coughs> Let's sing You Raise Me Up. Thank you, Jesus. When I am down and oh my so weary. When troubles come and my heart burns me, then I am still awake in a silence until you are. Thank you. 
Melchizedek, as we have mentioned in uh, the first service, in uh, chapter 7, just we quickly run through in 5 minutes to 10 minutes, just to get everyone who is not here in the first service up to speed where we are. In the uh, book of Hebrews, chapter 7, it says that uh, Melchizedek is a priest of God, but it tells us here in uh, chapter 7, in verse 3, he is without father and without mother and uh, without genealogy and you think the Bible literally is not just symbolic neither is Melchizedek uh, the same as our Lord Jesus Christ uh, Melchizedek as we have uh, brought forth was and that was his, not his original name he was once a cherub and he was the guardian angel of Adam and uh, when Adam failed in all his destiny only once uh, has an angel made request to God to be able to finish off. And that's how important guardian angels are. And that tells us that the guardian angels that be assigned in your life, they are very, very, uh, we can't use the word anxious because there's no anxiety with them, but they're very, very eager and very, very uh, 
paying the full attention that they can to make sure that you fulfill your destiny for your destiny is tied to the assignment uh, your failure is their failure your success is their success that's how much they are uh, united with us to see us through on this earth uh, so don't neglect the guardian angels they are given to you when Adam failed there was that part of the plan not finished and the cherub volunteered himself to help bear the burden of the rest of the incomplete world. Only once in the history of angels and the history of mankind has it ever been permitted. Uh, the only thing time that has happened was uh, the fallen angels and they did a bad thing. They, they manifested in the flesh and they started propagating among human race and the mixed race and that was not a plan of God. But this uh, cherub came and he took on the human role and took on the form of human flesh I know some of you say, hey, how can that be possible? Remember, the spiritual world makes the physical world. And you know all the verses for that, Hebrews 11, 3, and the Second Corinthians 4, things that are unseen, uh, uh, other things are eternal, and uh, that everything that is made is made from the spiritual substance. It's easy for spiritual substance to create natural substance. And uh, so, he came, took on human flesh, and live among humans as a priest to teach humans how to approach God and uh, we have said that uh, cherubs, cherubims, uh, seraphims and all the creatures with eyes around them uh, these creatures live on the seventh heaven that is their normal habitation and for them to come down something special takes place and so he came and uh, he finished his work when he blessed Abraham. And thus from then onwards, in the seed of Abraham lies the destiny of the human race. And that has been fulfilled in Christ, the seed of Abraham. And uh, then from Christ onwards now, and now that we are en entering the generation that will see the glorious church, that will see the rapture, Melchizedek has once again manifest. But this time as a cherub, and uh, he comes into the midst, although uh, uh, our physical Melchizedek, which is Pastor David's son, uh, has taken on a relationship with Melchizedek because he represents uh, the whole generation of this end time generation. And it's important uh, for what God wants to impart. But the role of the uh, chariot Melchizedek is for this whole end time. And uh, he, it is his role and his job to see the human race restored back to where it is. But he cannot save us. That's where Christ came and took on the priesthood of Melchizedek. And, and in Christ, we are able to enter the fullness of Adam's, the Adamic race destiny and rise into the dimension of God where God wants it and so thus we have said and we asked the question this morning what does it mean to have a better covenant you, you hear that all the time in the book of Hebrews 11 it says we have a better covenant gov govern, a covenant and all all that uh, the men of faith are listed in Hebrews chapter 11 at the end they say there's something better for us and we know the phrase better covenant and all those things and all that we talk about, better covenant, being born again, being in Christ, the Holy Spirit, empowerment, Holy Spirit dwelling in us, give of faith, the grace of God, as a joint as with Christ, relationship with the Father, all the wonderful aspects of being in the covenant of God is wonderful. But in the Bible, it tells us of uh, what this better covenant is. And if you have your Bible in Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, it tells us about the priesthood of Melchizedek and in verse 21 it says for they become priests without an all but he we have all by him who said to him in verse 21 Hebrews chapter 7 the Lord has sworn and will not relent you are a priest forever and talking about Jesus according to the order of Melchizedek and at the end of it is a comma not a full stop because the sentence continues in the verse 22 22 is only half a sentence it says by so much more Jesus has become 
assurity of a better covenant. And so the word better covenant is tied to Melchizedek. And whatever Melchizedek represents, and we have to identify what the priesthood of Melchizedek is. In the Old Testament, the Aaronic priesthood, you know, take away all the men of God who walk closely with God, and they, they walk because somehow they tap upon the, the revelation of Christ even in the Old Testament. People like Elijah, Enoch, uh, Moses, they, they have a glimpse of Christ to a certain extent. And so, in a sense, they were transformed by the Melchizedek revelation too. But the official person who is supposed to walk closest with God is the high priest. In the Old Testament, you have the uh, temple and the tabernacle of Moses. You have the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. And that symbolically tells you of the different degrees of walking with God. And the high priest, once a year, for a few minutes, enter into the second veil, sprinkle the blood and all, and with the incense going in, and comes out. Imagine, in typology, the man closest with God in the Old Testament high priest could only be in the Holy of Holies for a few minutes. A few seconds, in fact, if he was fast. But that's not good enough for us. That is why when God says you are kings and priests, he's not talking about the Aaron's priesthood. He's talking about Melchizedek priesthood. So what, what is a Melchizedek priesthood? Melchizedek his origin, and even more in Christ now, belongs. Melchizedek as the cherub belongs to the seventh heaven. And this morning we settled the question about the levels of heaven. We mentioned in Second Corinthians chapter 12 that Paul mentioned about himself in third person, he went to the third heaven. And uh, where there's a third, obviously there are levels, first, second. So even if you if you don't accept that there are more than three levels, you're going to accept there are levels of heaven. But the fact is the Bible never say the heaven only and no more. And it implies there could be levels. In fact, there are many levels. And, uh, and there are seven levels of heaven that exist in all this universe. Degrees that we of God. At the seventh level is where the cherubim, the seraphim and all these creatures live. Uh, creatures around the throne. For them, it's a normal habitation. And uh, you remember those creatures with eyes all around them? When they come to earth, they carry the presence of God. You know where the presence came from? Seventh heaven. Paul was so delighted to be able to see the third heaven. Now, uh, during A.S. Rock, Pastor David was taken to look at the seventh heaven. And uh, he saw uh, all the apostles, oh, hey, they reached the third level. Even Paul in his time reached the third level. But the privilege of the end time church because it's progression in the church to reach Paul at, at the beginning because there's seven levels of the church growth seven levels of that based on the seven horns of the Lamb based on the seven churches in the book of Revelation and Paul was happened to be only in the first degree there's seven levels of grace God gave and uh, Paul would have loved to live in our generation but you need a strong person like him to begin the Old Testament revelation into the New Testament. And don't forget, in Paul's time, it took them 10 to 20 years to settle the revelation of being born again and saved by grace. Which many of us received in a few minutes. Don't forget, it was not easy for them. And through the years, the church has understood revelation after revelation, built upon, sometimes with pain, with tribulation, here we are in the end time with a sevenfold revelation finally complete. And I know we can never compete with the zeal, the diligence, and the passion that Paul had. And of course, I'm sure there are there are individuals today that are as passionate. But as a whole, in the body of Christ, very rare this kind of character. And say, so how can we ever compete with Paul? It is not by works. Even Paul received everything by grace. In this New Testament, we will also receive it by grace. So the better covenant means, not only can we enter the Holy of Holies, 
Not just a few minutes. We can literally live there. And that is why the, this next coming revival, God is going to cause some of you to even not just being able to fast, you're able to live in God's presence for days. Don't eat. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. <laughs> just stay. You get caught up in the glory. It's going to happen soon. And people will enter God's presence and they feel like it's only a few hours come up. Say, what? One month has passed by. <laughs> this is where we're going to experience by the grace of God. What being in the seven heaven glory that God gives in one time. It is not our works. Not our ability. Thankfully, it's by His grace. If by works, all of us God. Hopeless case. Thank God by His grace. But still, even though by His grace, we need the skill how to receive how to absorb, how to partake of the grace of God. Remember how even in the book of Galatians, Paul says, do not, do not neglect grace. And he says, uh, he told the Galatians, you have fallen from grace. Can you imagine? Grace also can fall. He wants them. He used the phrase, fallen from grace, because they went back to the law. They did not understand how to appropriate the promises of Christ. They went back to works to try to earn credit again. And although we, we work hard, we, we love God passionately, we always recognize that under the day, it is by His grace. It is His grace that He establishes. All that we do only helps us to put ourselves in a position. And we look at the harmony of that today. And we understand where the Melchizedek generation is, that we are the Melchizedek generation to enter into seventh heaven. And when Christ comes, in book of Revelation, it talks about new heaven and new earth. For lack of a better word, we call that the revelation of the Lamb of God's heaven. And that is, to put it mathematically, like in heaven. Who knows in eternity God's going to reveal 9, 10, 11, 12 onwards. Because there's so much more of God. We only hardly touch the revelation of God. And do you know for billions of years, even the angels and angels have never seen more than a seven heaven. That is why Christ is so special. When Christ comes and He finishes all His work and cleanse and bring the redeemed church out, which is His bride, He's going to revamp the whole of heaven and the universe. And it's like He's going to reveal the eighth level of heaven. That's why angels are interested. Say, wow, this is something we haven't seen before. It's something they have never experienced before. And you are not a privilege. And to reveal the eight means you must master the seven. How can you learn uh, a calculus until you have finished mastering, mastering your addition, subtraction, multiplication, and, uh, and, and uh, all your binomial theorem, and, and all your algebra, then only you learn all these other things. And so how can we master and, and be with Christ to enter into the Lamb's revelation of heaven, the eighth heaven, unless we are familiar with the seven? And that is why it is our honor and the honor and grace bestowed upon the end time generation, being the seventh level of development of the church through the seven church ages, to bring forth the revelation of the seven revelation level. Or walking closely with God. And we end up with a question, how do we do that? How, how do we enter the fullness of that? And that is where uh, we talk about the two, the play on the two Greek words of power, iskus and cross. Now, we want to re-establish that for those of you who, who have not uh, had the teaching. Under normal Christian life, you will learn that there are two Greek words for power. Dunamis, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture you want for that, there are many all places by you want Acts 1 verse 8. You shall receive dunamis when the Holy Spirit come upon you. And then the other one is exousia. And uh, that is the authority, authoritative power, and uh, executive power. And uh, that one you find in John chapter 1 verse uh, 12, uh, where it says, As many as believe him to them, he gave the exousia, authority to be sons of God. So there's exousia power. 
And, uh, but then there's Iskus and Kratos. Uh, Iskus power uh, is found in James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Uh, let's just look at James chapter 5. And so we, we, we although our, our sermons are consecutive, building one, uh, we, we preach a sermon such that even if you just hear like part 6, you still can catch it to a certain extent of what is needed at that time. But, uh, so we, we are giving you a, a brief overview in the book of James. In chapter 5, talk about prayer of a righteous man. Inside, a little passage where he talks about prayers of a righteous man, he talks about availing much in verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another, pray for one another, then you may be healed. The effective, which is a Greek word to energizing, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The word avail also means to prevail much. But if prevail, the word avail, prevail, and the same meaning, is the word iskuo, which is from the noun iskus, I-S-C-H-U-S. Now, most of you know the spell uh, dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S. You know the spell exousia, E-X-O-U-S-I-A. And uh, Iskus is I-S-C-H-U-S. Sometimes it has been translated as the word power to or strength or energy. And uh, so, so we relate dunamis power to the Holy Spirit. We relate, relate ex, uh, exousia power to the position in Christ. The position as a child of God, son of God, executive authority. And we relate Iskus power to prayer. It's the energy that is released in prayer. And in the book of Acts chapter 19, there are many places where you can find this, but we choose some that uh, makes it simple. 19 verse 20. It says, So the word of the Lord grew. Wow, the word of the Lord can grow. It grew mightily. And prevail. The word prevail is the word kratos. It means like it begins to conquer. It begins to increase in its impact and authority in the community. And its, its authority and power grow. And so like the kingdom of God expanding itself. And uh, the word prevail is the word kratos. Romanized K-R-A-T-O-S, Kratos. These are all noun forms. There is a word form called Kratio, but just learn the noun form will do, Kratos. Kratos relates to the power of the word. That is why some Christians, they spend a lot of time, pray, 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 pray. They are actually quite strong. But you notice, although they are strong, they are also weak. They are weak in the word's power. They are strong in his school's power, but weak in uh, word power. Some Christians, they don't pray. They always read Bible, read Bible, read Bible. Or they know a lot of Bible. And they got a level of authority and power in their life. But they don't, don't pray much. They got some power. But you, if you come to them closely, come to know them, you realize they got certain energy. But the energy is different from the other guy who pray a lot. And because they got word power. So there are all these dynamics of power. And uh, uh, Dunami's power is that which... Dunamis and exousia is that which is affected outwardly. Outward. So when dunamis power is on you, you know it. And it has an impact on people. It brings gifts of the spirit. Ex, uh, exousia power is there like an authoritative power. When a pronunciation is made under the authority, it sticks. Uh, demons flee. And uh, also, uh, uh, when a judgment is pronounced or when a blessing is pronounced, phew, it goes forth very powerfully. And uh, that's all external. Internally, is Kratos and Discus power that builds into us. So if you're going to divide it to understand it, Dunamis and Exousia are outward working. Discus and Kratos are inward working. Although they're inward working, they have an impact outside. Also, uh, they have an impact outside, uh, outward. And they are more like, you know how sometimes they look, they look slow in process, but they can be powerful. It's sometimes like when you look at a huge tree that grows uh, in a neighborhood, 
You see the tree root sometimes grows stronger and stronger until it even breaks the cement. You, you didn't see the tree like, you know, one day knocking the cement, no. But as it grows, it pushes the cement, it pushes the tile, pushes the bricks and the bricks break. He said, wow, what a strong tree. But the tree didn't do it overnight. It was slow, steady, but it can damage a lot of things. It can damage. So some trees, the roots are so strong, it can damage uh, even cement things, and uh, depend on how, and different types of versions of trees. And uh, so you see that very often when you walk along the pavement, uh, it's the tree roots that sometimes uh, upset all this the smooth surface that humans build. You see the interplay of all these powers in Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three. If you read it in the Greek, it will straight away grieve you that Paul was using all the three Greek words and interplaying them in the growth of uh, the church and the growth of the power. Notice that in order to grow fully, so under normal Christian teaching, you probably learn at some point in Christian long enough that there are two Greek words for power. There are now four. There are actually four. And there are uh, Dunamis, Exousia, Kratos, Iskus. There are four Greek words that they translated power <coughs> at some point in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 3, and uh, as Paul prayed for them, this is where the interplay of the power starts coming. It starts with prayer in verse 14. Ephesians 3 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might. Now, that's the first play on power. It says, in the Greek, it says, to be kratos with dunamis. He's using two words for power here. That you will be kratos with dunamis through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth and height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And uh, here, uh, according to the dynamis that works in each one of us. So, do you notice that love is mentioned? Uh, dunamis is mentioned? Kratos is mentioned. And uh, then, he said, now, where does exousia exist? It exists in your position in the church. Now, then you cross-reference Ephesians chapter 1, where all the four are interchanged. And this time, he actually mentioned the word exousia. In uh, verse uh, 18, again a prayer of Paul. He prayed that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of glory is inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his dunamis toward us who believe according to the working of his Iskus Kratos. See, it's a mighty power there. The mighty power is the word Iskus Kratos. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and exousia and might and dominion and every name that is named. So, in one short passage, you have all the interplay uh, of the Greek words. That is where in chapter 3, verse 14 to 21, 
when it talks about in verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that covers your exodus, your power. And, uh, so the first prayer and the second prayer leads into one another. And you notice, it's the level of the word, level of prayer that builds into our life. And the more he is built, you see, exousia, why exousia and uh, dunamis, why can't it be upon people stronger? Because power needs a containment. Power needs to be channeled, even you want electricity, it needs to be channeled from wherever your main generator is to where your house or building uh, or commercial building or residential building is. It has to be channeled in. And the channeling is a complex process. You have to have the right wire rate and depend on the distance, then it's step up transformers each way to make sure that it reaches your place at the exact power that you want. Not more, not less. And of course, more power needs to go to an industrial place than a residential place. And uh, overall, even in your own house, more power goes to your kitchen than any other part of your, uh, of your building. Which is why in some homes, uh, the kitchen actually got direct three-phase wiring there, which that doesn't go to your bedroom where you don't need, right? How much light do you need? And, and you, you sell them, you know, do cooking in your bedroom. Uh, and when it's cooking, you tend to suck a lot of energy and power. There's a process of channeling to build, to contain the power. How does this relate to Melchizedek generation? Very good question. Hebrews chapter 6 relates that to be the Marquisi that God needs to build into us. You can take it that uh, there is a process of building into us and it building up from us towards God. In the book of Hebrews 6, you see the play of two power words. When you talk about the Melchizedek generation, now, chapter 6 of Hebrews introduced the Melchizedek generation. In verse 20, then he spends the whole chapter talking about Melchizedek. And uh, the background of it is this, that in verse 18, 19, and 20, he says that by two immutable things, you're talking about faith for the rapture, faith comes by the word, and the word has kratos power. And God says he swore by two powerful immutable things, for lack of a better word, in which is impossible for God to lie. What are the two things? One is the person of God, who God is. The other is His Word, which is immutable. So the two things refer to part of the character of God. God is saying, I'm, I'm giving you a promise based on who I am, that His name is God, and also by my Word, my word has a force in itself. So these are the two things. God and His word. We have seen in the universe that His word creates the universe. And then God talked about Himself. So there are these two immutable things. The person of God, the word of God. And uh, by these two immutable things, God speaks His promises. He says, in which it is impossible for God to lie that we might have See, those two immutable so that we might have, we might have what? We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Now, the word lay hold of the hope is important because we are laying hold of the hope. What is hope for? Hold your place in Hebrews 6. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. So, faith is a process of laying a hold, taking that faith and making it into a substance. And so, understanding that, Hebrews chapter 6, we lay hold on this hope. But part of the laying hold, our ability to lay hold, depends on the other two things here. It says, we might have. The word might have is the Greek word kratio, which is the word form of the word kratos. And what it says is that we, we kratos it. 
knowing that there's God's person, the person of God and the word of God. In our relationship to the person of God, our relationship to the word of God, we kratos and receive it. And then, strong consolation. The word consolation is parakritos. Uh, here is paraklesis, which is a, 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 sort of a different sort of noun, a causative noun. Um, a cause. So, the, the result of the parakritos, one called alongside, is also the title of the Holy Spirit. He is the parakritos, one called alongside. Para means alongside. Kletos was from the word uh, kaleo, and the derivation of that, parakletos. And so, uh, a strong advocate, a strong calling alongside of something. And the word strong, it's the word iskus. But here in a, in a different form, iskuo, but same root. So in that one word, we see these two powers working into us. And for the first time, we see the relationship of these powers. Iskus power relates to prayer. Prayer relates to the person of God. That's how it flows. Kratos relates to the word. The word relates to the word of God where faith comes. So on one side, faith comes. On the other side is prayer power. And the essence of prayer power is love. It's love, to make it simple. So one side is love. One side is faith. The essence of word power is when you squeeze the word, what's the essence? Faith. The essence of relating to God's person is love. So, Iskus power relates to the power of love. God's love for you, your love for God. Faith power relates to the word of God working in you and you believing God's word. See the relationship. There's a due relationship here. And so, there's a relationship to the word, there's a relationship to love. And you say, how does the two relate? The two are related in the words Galatians 5 or 6. For faith is energized by love. So, it is love that energizes you. So, I give an illustration this morning. Let's say you have uh, most batteries that you buy, are uh, either 9 volts battery, the, uh, the rectangular shaped one. Uh, guitars usually use 9 volts battery. And the battery runs out. I think every other every every month or every few months, we have to change the batteries uh, on the guitar. It doesn't last forever. Imagine you buy a battery and it lasts forever. All the battery shops will close very fast, right? They only need to sell you one battery. You only need to buy one battery for the rest of your life. Oh, that would be wonderful, but not wonderful for the producer <laughs> for the battery because they will sell more. And so, uh, one kind of battery. Uh, last forever because it runs out and so when you draw from a 9 volt battery you can draw 9 volts maximum can draw 9 volts uh, but it needs to be recharged if you can recharge it then you can keep reusing it and the recharging process is the energizing of love but the amount of voltage is your level of faith if you've got 9 volt faith that's the most you can do, whatever 9 volts can do. Some of you might have only 1.5 volts faith, which is the AA size of the AA size battery, tiny little round ones, 1.5 volts. And uh, that's all that you can. And, uh, and, and then it takes, and let's say, this is just illustration, let's say a healing takes 9 volts, and you go 1.5 volt. What are you gonna do? <laughs> and uh, that would take at least uh, uh, six six of you. Uh, and you thought if I do six times, but each time only 1.5, it cannot push. You cannot push against the cancer. So what are you gonna do? I find six people with 1.5 volt. Connect them together like a battery. <laughs> and then you have 6 times 1.5. Does that mean it's not enough? What? I mean, come. Is that enough? That's enough, right? Okay, thank you very much. The math's going on. No, we need one more. Nice. 
deck. Six, right? Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, six. Because you got the other half deck. Yeah, six plus three, you're right. So six. So I would have six people pray, finally can move the sickness. But then one believer comes with nine volts. What? Finish. Because he got nine volt faith. And that's what's happening in reality in the dimension of the spirit. But the thing is that sometimes the nine volt guy pray, then afterward, it goes into some depression. And then he goes out and oh shit, why? He got no more energy to run his own life. No more thing. That's why something you see preachers, they do all those things. And you read about some of them, A. Allen, Hugh, so many people became drunkard, you know, and this one did this. Because they got no more energy to run their own life. All the energy is there, suck up dry. And uh, it takes them a long time to recharge. Because the recharging is love, the force of love. And, and that's how it goes. But one of your person got very strong love. And then you continually keep drawing. Still, the diamonds keep as strong as ever. And that's when love is important. Faith is important, love is important. And faith is energized by love. And that's the illustration we have. Just like your cars usually use 12 volts. And normally, if your car in your car is a, is a little thing called an alternator, the alternator recharges your car battery as your car moves. If your alternator spoils, the newest battery you have might only last a few months. And your car cannot start again. Why? Because you're draining power out of the battery and it's not being recharged. And they can look and say, hey, why can't your car recharge? The batteries are still new, the connections are new, and you have to top up the battery. Now there's a battery, now there's almost no need to top up one, you know, you've got the sealed ones. And, uh, and if everything looked good, what's wrong? It was not recharged. Your alternator was a thing to now, not your battery. So they put your alternator back and then it recharge and you could fully gain the charge again. You use your battery for a year. Sometimes some people use it for two years, depending on how often you use your car. And uh, then uh, it lasts longer. And so that's the illustration we can in the natural to look at the things of spirit. Uh, it's cool power and Kratos power are what charges us. It's our deep relationship with God. Now you notice that there is always a, a cold relationship. You relate to God, you relate to His Word. You relate to His Word, you relate to God. Look at John chapter 15. It jumps between those uh, uh, relationships. John chapter 15. Jesus says in verse 1, I am the true wine, my Father is a wine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear Fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 2 is talking about you relating to Jesus as a person. And he says, you're really clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Suddenly, the word also is important. A relationship you have with the word. How much the word cleanses you. Then in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. That's your relationship with Jesus. As a branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the wine, neither can you unless you abide in me. That's your relationship with Jesus. Then I am the one here, the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. Again, your relationship with Jesus. Uh, that's a love relationship. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, as bitter, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7. If you abide in me, that is, if you want to abide in me as a person, he says, and my words abide in you. Suddenly you need the word. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, what's the difference between verse 7 and verse 5? Verse 5 talks about bearing fruit. You can bear fruit. Fruit of love. You love Jesus. Jesus loves you. You are by Him. Your relationship with Him is fine. But you know one thing? No matter how you pray, you can't exactly get accurate in your prayer until verse 7. You have the words. And you got in line with the word. And you know what to pray for, you know how the word works, and the word comes into your life. Suddenly, what you ask shoo, comes to pass. <coughs> See, there's a relationship you have with the word, which is a separate relationship. And it moves one between the other. Then it was nine. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you, you abide in my love. Then it was ten, back to his word again. You keep my commandments, which is his word, you will abide in my love. See, the thing keeps 
uh, relating back to one another. Just as I have kept my father's commandment and abiding his love. So abide in the word also is abiding his love. The two are all interrelated. And uh, in chapter 14, he also talks about the, 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 the two. In verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, now that talks about the word. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you often I come to you. That's him as a person. It was 18. And then he relates back uh, continually. He says in verse uh, 21, chapter 14, John. He who has my commandments, that's his word, and keeps them, that's keeping his word, it is he who loves me. That will help you to love him back again. And you love him by loving his word. He who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now notice, you need to keep his word. You need to love him for God to manifest. Now you know why God doesn't show many visions to people and many things. God trained me in a different way he trained uh, Pastor David. Uh, I was trained 10 solid years in the word. I call them the word that came. And a uh, uh, few visions here and there, but mainly the word. And then uh, there's uh, 1976 to 1986. Then I was trained in the way of the spirit, the decade of spirit. And that is from uh, 1986 to 1996. And so his training in that dimension. And uh, that, is, is that decade started with Jesus appearing to me in a vision. And I met Jesus. And uh, so he teach me about the anointing of the spirit. <coughs> and how to be sensitive to the Spirit, flow with the Spirit of God. And when you don't have both balance, the revelation of God cannot come completely into your life. It's important to balance both before God starts being willing to manifest more. And uh, we are together with Pastor David, I were together, we are talking to someone for who, and then Pastor David was sharing how that uh, he has been open vision all the time. But the open vision cannot move forward. Because he, he didn't have anyone to talk to and he was rejecting all those things. And uh, until uh, the dynamics came when we both came together. For me, I was solid in the world. And then, but I was also in the spirit and I've seen vision. He has never met somebody else who had been into the spirit world. So, so he could share his experience and, and it drawn out from him. And then whatever he received now as I... Bring scriptures, the word, like that's a cute revelation. I found it in Ephesians 3. Everything that you hear, I said, okay, here's the word, here's the word. Now, when you establish a revelation by the word, God can reveal more. But how many thousands of people they got spirit vision here, then slowly they make their own wrong doctrine, go outside the word, and then God stop using that. Sometimes God stop using, after some time, the devil start entering into their life and giving false revelation. Because they need to be the word to protect that revelation. At the same time, the word alone. There are a lot of people with a lot of hate knowledge of the word. And, uh, and, and uh, the word, the word, the word, and they don't believe in gifts of spirit, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit, they don't believe in uh, uh, visions, and all those things also cannot. You, you have that, you also need the spiritual dimension. You don't move on, God. Only when both are balanced, Iskus power and Kratos power are balanced, can God take us. God take us deeper and in safety. And God is confident to reveal more because He will never contradict His word. And so sometimes some of you pray for visions. You don't have enough word. Because you want shortcut, it's lightning. Eh? <laughs> but even lightning could not bring Pastor David into the deeper dimension. It was only in safety that we relate together. Because the angel started working more and no more. Because he you knows there's a safety. Safety net is there of the world. Because everything only started happening, how long ago is it? About one and a half years, right? That's all. But he'd be having open wish all the time. Could not. He saw angels, but could not also. Because there's that safety. And even now, when we move further, I noticed something about the downloads. Unless we absorb it, understand it, relate it to the word, no more downloads. 
But because we are very fast, absorb, download, research, and then got all in the word, the next one can come. Otherwise, the downloads just like in a circle, do this, do that, do this, do that. That's it. But fresh revelation only when you absorb the understanding. From the word, the word established the next platform. Very important for us that these two must be together, the word and the spirit. And for the second generation, these two forces of Iskus and Kratos must grow into our lives. Faith for the rapture needs to come so deep. You need to love the word. And one thing I like about this new generation is what I call extremes. Either they are, they are passionate for God or they are not for God. They are not for God, they are not for God. Because in this generation, you've got so many choices to do things in your life. So many things offered that no other generation has. And the new generation that is rising, some of them will be so deep in the Word, it's like the Word is their life. Now, they will be balanced about other things also in life. But they're going to absorb the Word like never before. You can spend time in prayer like never before when they pray. And it's, and it's this dimension that is there. Now, let's look at the book of Hebrews back again. Hebrews chapter 6, where we took off. And uh, we continue to build this understanding of, we talk about the Melchizedek generation. We understand what the Melchizedek generation is to bring us to until we our worship, our lifestyle is like living in the seventh heaven. And uh, I know that the English expression is an expression, right? It's the seventh heaven, the ninth heaven, whatever. But, but we're talking about realities eh, of dimensions in God. And uh, in the seventh heaven, uh, I asked Pastor David to describe among the first, third, the second, third, I described different things. And we could not go near the downloads also because he need to pause and, uh, and get different things. But we will get more information for you. Because I know some of you are very curious what all the different heavens are like. And I did describe in the first service and some of the creatures that live there in the different things. But in the seventh heaven, it is filled with seraphim cherubim. They'll be like walking out in the streets and, and because this is the Holy Holy's level. And then, is you remember you saw those four creatures uh, that hold the glory of God that talk about on one side they look like a man, one side look like a lion, one side like an eagle, one side like, a, uh, like an ox. And, uh, and, and these creatures contain, Ezekiel also saw it, they, they hold the glory of God. Well, in the seventh heaven, they are everywhere hundreds of them. He only saw a section, but I could see my spirit, millions of them. Entire worlds filled with them. You will be the only one strange looking with two eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All of them, these creatures, and they're very holy. And, uh, and, and then there's something about, about, about the four faces they have. It's not like when you look at them, uh, they got four faces, you look, hey, I'm looking at you, hey, I'm looking at you. What? How do you relate to a, pers to a person with four faces? You're always facing them. Which is front, which is back. <laughs> They're not like that. And this is what they actually are like. Uh, let's talk about, illustrate it, first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear. Okay. In first gear, they are just like you and I, humans. Look exactly like us, humans. But then, as, as they begin to worship or they begin to walk at a faster dimension, second year, their faces change until their faces become to look like an ox. Then, as they move in certain, if there's such a thing as movement, for lack of a better word, or energize themselves in their relationship walk with God, faster still. And you cannot really see the speed. The speed is so fast that all you see is the reflection. Let's say if I move my hand like that, you know, uh, how many fingers do I have? Well, how to count, correct? So, but then uh, you see a shape. You see something like a fan shape, correct? So, uh, if you move very, very fast, you might say, you know, this guy got fan shaped hands. But no, it's not fan shaped hands, right? So, because of the speed, when they go second gear, they begin to look. Their faces resemble that of an ox. Then they move third gear, not to say they got gear, then they, <laughs> they say, hey, you got automatic transmission or not? No. So, and then when they move in a dimension of worship higher and deeper, they begin to, their faces begin to change to look like a lion. 
Then when they go fourth gear, <laughs> sound effects are mine. <laughs> For them, no sound effects, just hear them move. And uh, for, for year, uh, they began to look like an eagle. Then when they slow down again, they will go back to a lion, ox, and then like a man again. So they can relate to you, man to man. Now, when you see the four faces, it's because there's, all these movements are melted into one. So that's why from different directions, they say, hey, they've got all these four faces. So that's some of the description of, of all these uh, creatures, that are interesting creatures. These are creatures of the holiest. And remember what they're doing. They always say, Holy, Holy, Holy is a lot of holes. And somebody say, like, you know, like they go around around the throne and go, Holy, Holy, Holy is a lot of holes. You know how long they've been doing that? In our early time, since the beginning. Since God exists and created the world. You see them, once in a while, the human side glimps at them. Isaiah chapter uh, 6 glimps at them. Hey, they're doing that. Then, some is, sometime there, you see Ezekiel glimps. Hey, they're also doing that. Then, uh, John, the apostle, glimps at them. Hey, they're still doing that. Separated by thousands of years. They've been doing that for billions of years. See, don't they get tired? Don't they get tired? Only one phrase. Holy! Holy! Some of you, if I ask you to worship God, <laughs> even one song sing holy, 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 you sing that one song over and over again, you also get very tired. One hour you really get tired, you cannot sing a new song. <laughs> they are holy, holy. And, and so sometimes it's because they're so near to God, that someone put it this way that I like the way they put it. They say when they, they worship God, holy, holy, holy. And then when, when they when go around saying holy, then they see God again. Oh, it's like a new revelation of God. Wow, holy, 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 holy. Then they look and go, what a new revelation. Holy, holy, holy. That has been going on. And each round they go for billions of years, each time they go, they saw something new in God. Wow! Think how much they have absorbed over so many rounds around the throne of God. Which is why it's not a bad idea being a pillar in the temple of God. Remember one of the promises? And sometimes I say, yeah, how many want to be pillars? You say, wow, you mean in heaven I have to be there holding up the roof? <laughs> and then everybody could tour the universe, go here, go there. You'll be there, you know? And then we say, ah, see you later, Charlie. Let's say your name is Charlie. And then after 10,000 years, we come back and say, hey, you're still there. Yeah, la, sorry, la, I'm a pillar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was such a sad life. Not such a sad life in heaven. So being a pillar in the temple, of God, something glorious. And uh, because you can move about and, and all, all those things. It's talking about more your spiritual position. How close you are in God. And God wants us to be really close to Him. In the seven. Uh, to the seventh heaven, something that Paul wished he could have. But unfortunately, he was in the first phase of the church. There are seven phases. And the second phase will include the first. Third will include the first and second. We are in the seventh phase of the church. It is our blessing, our privilege uh, to be able to absorb the seven levels to reach to the seventh heaven that God wants us to enter. And so looking at that, we realize in chapter 6, in Hebrew chapter 6, that we are the Melchizedek generation. And it talks about how in verse 18, the two forces of Iskus and Kratos are established in us through the person and the word of God. And so that we could lay hold of the hope that set before us. And it says in verse 19, this hope is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. That is the Melchizedek generation. We live in that holy of holies. To enter that presence. We know our spirit is there. But God wants your soul to enter. And David would wish his soul could but he was Old Testament. So the best he can say is, 
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within from the outer court. But in the New Testament, your spirit, your soul, and those who see the rapture in translation, your body enters the veil. The reason why you are raptured is because your body enters. <laughs> of course, it doesn't have some effect. <laughs> when the rapture takes place, it might be very silent. You go, you're there. And uh, so, otherwise, the devil will listen for the sound. <laughs> right. In fact, the rapture takes place, he still didn't know for nearly a day. Because we are all worshipping. And it is the body enters. The day that I'm translated, my body enters. Shoo, doesn't see death into that dimension. And because before that, probably already uh, more and more. The closer you walk with God, haven't some of you walked so close with God that Moses tasted a bit? When he entered into God's presence, 40 days, no need to eat, no need to sleep. 40 days. That's marvelous. 40 days. No sleep, no eating, and he survived. Now, Elijah had that when he ate some of the angels' food. It lasted for 40 days and 40 nights as he traveled uh, in God in 1 Kings 19. So there's something of a deposit that can come into us. And that is only Old Testament. How much more the New Testament? When the presence of God can be absorbed by you. Now we talk about the body. When the body enters, there's a rapture or translation. When your soul enters. And your soul, depending on how fast you're growing in God, needs to enter before your, your body can enter. So I could imagine the dimension, the second, third, fourth, fifth generation, their soul will have entered the Holy of Holies. What kind of a soul is like when the soul, we all know our spirits are already there, but our soul enters the Holy of Holies. So, encouragement to the first generation. Even if your body cannot enter, your soul can enter. When your soul enters the Holy of Holies and live there, it's a different soul. The way you think, the way you feel, different. Because your soul is spiritualized. And that's why part of the process of knowing the angels, hearing them without, without open vision, every one of you, you could do that as your soul becomes spiritualized. Your soul tunes to the spirit and you can recognize the thoughts that come. Thoughts of your angels, which angel, thoughts from the Holy Spirit, thoughts from God the Father, thoughts from Jesus. You could differentiate them. You could know which one of them. As your soul becomes spiritualized. The whole New Testament is about the salvation of the soul. And the salvation of the soul is the complete redemption of the soul by the blood of Jesus. And only Jesus can do that. He infuses his life into our spirit, soul, and body. So that our soul is transformed. And that is why he says, when you have this hope in you, this hope is the anchor of your soul. So your soul will never go astray again. Your soul will be a sinless soul. And then your body will be a sinless body. And not by your own strength, but by the life of Jesus in you. And God continue to transform our soul. And this transformation, uh, you don't have to be anxious about it. It is growing in you. You're being transformed. And transformation takes time. And it, some things need an ideal time to form within us. It's just like uh, when a, a, a mother is pregnant, it takes ideally, ideally about nine months. You try to hasten the process, not good for the 
for the uh, infant or the or the fetus, and uh, it needs an ideal period for all the organs and tissues uh, to form properly. The heart of the child, the, the liver, and the fingers, and all that form nicely before the child is born. It might be tiny, but every organ is perfectly formed. So it needs those nine months gestation period. So some things need a gestation period in us to grow and is fully formed. Different attributes of the soul, different parts of the soul. The Bible talks about it in many different languages. Renewal of the mind. It's a renewal of the soul. The mind is part of the soul. And uh, growing in love. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness. That is the spirit force by your soul gaining spiritual nature. Because uh, it talks about the works of the flesh, which is the soul, against the fruit of the spirit. Now, if the spirit bears fruit, where is the fruit? In your soul. The spirit grows into your soul. And your soul is transformed to be exactly like the spirit. And of course, it can grow further all the way under a physical manifestation. And so this anchor is important. Now, here's the word. It says that we could lay hold of the hope set before us. I want to now talk about the laying hold process. It is not so much we lay hold of God as God laying hold of us. It is like a simultaneous thing. Like I say, is it you love God or is it God loves you? Both. Although in human terms we feel the response time that we love God. But the Bible says in 1 John, we love Him because He first loved us. And because He loves us, we love Him. And we love Him, He responds, more love, we love Him more. You can see the reciprocal reaction. He continues to produce it. And the same way with faith. In faith, is it your faith or is it God's faith in you? It's God's faith in you, but then you go to exercise your faith. And then the process repeats itself. Because you exercise, more the work comes in, increase your faith. So the Bible says, faith grows. In any illustration of faith, it's always faith like a seed. A master seed. A seed grows. So don't be too concerned when you hear all this thing. Oh, oh, I must pray. Oh, it's good power. Pray, pray, pray. Then young people go away. Say, no, your mother say, eat. Say, no, 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 must fast, must fast. <laughs> How long? Say, 40 days. Oh, oh. Your mother say, Days are eating at Jesus. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, 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 one meal fast. Okay. But she didn't fast. Okay. Uh, oh, but fast. But, but you have to do better than Jesus. Jesus do 40 days. And since your fast is not his quality, he said, no, I'm not in 20 days. Fast, fast, fast. Pray, 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 fast. Whoa, so much anxiety. You know, like a pregnant woman can get anxious about giving birth. No matter how anxious he is, at three months, he's still not time yet. <laughs> you ask the baby inside, you know, the year time to come out, if the baby can talk, not yet, not yet, sir, I still need six more months. But the mother says, If you go hear the baby, the baby just say, Please relax, mom. You're jarring my abode. <laughs> it's very hard to grow with you moving so anxiously. And by the way, is produce extra chemicals which will now make me slightly funny <laughs> because you know fear anxiety produce chemicals and the baby responds so when the baby grow up the mother is so anxious for well, all the anxiety chemicals go to the baby baby grow up very tense person <laughs> do things very tense <laughs> instead of being a relaxed baby and so you know no good being too tense and uh, and all this it's a growth process. Some things just came out. It's like a little boy. We have little boys here. Yeah, the little boy here. And uh, you know, and uh, one day, you know, you will be able to grow a moustache or beard or whatever. Although it might not be the fashion now. If we were all Israelites, they're all looking forward to when they can grow because that's the fashion there. Oh, beard, oh, oh, all those things. So, uh, if you even the olden Israelites, they will grow for look forward. 
Now imagine that the little boy very anxious. Oh, every day look at the mirror. When will my beard appear? Oh, every day help pull a bit, massage it a little bit. <laughs> you think it help? Whatever. It's not gonna help. You know, you just have to reach puberty before you start growing a beard. And I can guarantee by the time you really start growing, some people are more hairy than others. And uh, by the time you start growing, you might wish that it doesn't grow so fast. <laughs> Because some people, their hair grows so fast, you know, they shave in the morning, night time, you say, hey, you didn't shave. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it, when, when the time comes, it will just take place at puberty. In the same way, growth comes at the process. But we need to understand that process is more a process of entering into the rest. Letting the word soak into you. And when we say, which comes first? Like, some things the world has no answer. Which comes first? The chicken or the egg? The world still don't have an answer. Right? We all know the answer. If we believe the Bible. The chicken came first. Because God didn't in the beginning make eggs. <laughs> and then the eggs produced the chicken. He didn't. Right? He made the birds of the air. And whatever animals in there. The eggs came second stage. Then later, he start the cycle again. So, the Bible solves a lot of mystery. So, the next time, you can say, young people, they say, we know the answer to that question. Tell me you know, the chicken came first. But the other question, why the chicken crossed the road, no answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, which one comes first? You love God, or God loves you first? We all know the answer. That one you also should know. Don't any one of you dare say, I love God first, you know. Wow. Do you think you are? God loves you first. We responded to the love and love God. And it's God who loves us. First John solved the problem for us. We love Him because He first loved us. God took initiative. If Jesus died on the cross, show his love. That's why so many people are willing to die for God. When you look at Jesus and know who Jesus is, what he has done, how can you help not falling in love with God? Before Jesus came, not many people love God. He tried so hard with the Israelites. God says, love me, I will love you. You must love me. My commandment says, you must love me. You must love me. Oh, then try, 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 fail, give up. Because they had no example. God did say, I love you, but not good enough. Because first of all, they got frightened by God's voice. I love you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> they run away. But when Jesus died on the cross, and God said, this is how much I love you, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. How can you have not falling in love with your God like that? That's why we all love God. Because He loves us first. Now, growth is the same way. He must put something into us. <coughs> Iskus and Kratos. Before the Iskus and Kratos can come up back to Him. Understand that process. <coughs> Unless He put into us, there's nothing to come out from us. So we must be in the position to receive. It's not something you can create and energize by yourself. It's more you create and put into us. And so we see the, in our this series we have talked about the word hypostasis. Let's re-examine that again in this life. In Hebrews chapter eleven, the word substance is the word hypostasis, and that's. Uh, the word that has been translated substance here, and it says in Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is the hypostasis, H-U-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-S, hypostasis, of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it's something real, it's a spiritual substance. Spiritual substance. But that word hypostasis has been translated in chapter 1, is used three times in the book of Hebrews. First time it's used, in fact, Hebrews 11 verse 1 is the third time. The first time it's used is Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person 
upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged out of sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty and high. Verse 3. The express image of his hypostasis. Now it's translated as person. But you could have put the word substance. It's just that they want to be more reverent to God. And literally, if they translated the word consistently in one book, like the book of Hebrews, they would have put it here. Jesus is the brightness of His glory, who being the brightness of glory and the express image of His substance. Jesus was like the substance of God that we can relate to as a person. That would be the word substance again, hypostasis. The second time is used is in chapter 3. And this is an interesting usage that relates to where we are going today. Hebrews 3 verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our hypostasis steadfast to the end. So there's a beginning of the substance being put in us. So as it's put into us, we must hold, what do we hold? We hold on to the substance God gives us. The hypostasis. The substance of hope. The substance of things not seen. But it's inside our spirit somewhere. This deposit. And that's a substance from God Himself. Hypostasis, as we can see in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 1, is related to the substance of Christ. Some sort of spiritual infusion of His life. A spiritual impartation of Himself in us. And it is true. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So a part of Him is deposited into us. That is why in uh, Ephesians 3 it talks about Him dwelling in uh, us. We are strengthened so that He can dwell inside us. So His His indwelling upon us. But the interesting thing here in uh, Hebrews 3 verse 14 is the word here for we have become partakers if we hold. The word hold or lay hold as it's translated is the word uh, that is formed from a combination of three words, uh, two words. One is the word echo, to have. The other is the word kata, which is uh, down. So it's like to hold down, to hold within us. To hold, why must hold down? Until it grows in us. It takes root. Remember the parable of the sower and the, and the word. He sowed the word. The word needs to take root. So the ground must hold until the seed grows and forms roots. Once the roots are strong, then it's okay by itself. The most dangerous time when you plant anything is when it's still very young. But once that whatever you plant becomes a huge tree, I mean you still got to take care of it, but it's pretty strong, it's a one by itself. But it's when it's a tiny little shoot, tiny little plant growing, that's when the ground around it must be important. That's why a seed that is put into good ground, it will grow. And you put into hard soil, sometimes the seed cannot survive. It's important for the ground to hold fast. The problem is the ground is us. And we have a free will. We have to lay a hold. And keep the word. Hold on to the word. Until the word is established. But part of the process of holding on is interesting. And uh, you, you see here in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Christ Jesus. The word confession not just speak about the spoken word, something that you speak. The word confession is the word homologia. Homo, as you all know, means similar kind. 
Logia is a derivation of the word Logos, the word of God. So it's like having the same word, saying and agreeing with the word. And, uh, and you have to look at the context of his usage. Somebody teach homologia in uh, one of the big churches, I remember, and I heard that teacher say, hey, that's not, not proper usage of the Greek. Uh, they try to turn 1 John 1, uh, verse 9, where it says, uh, uh, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you. So the person tried to twist the scripture and use the word homologia to mean, no need to confess your sin, just say who you are in Christ. Wrong teaching. It says, confess your sin. It didn't say, confess who you are. Anyone reading plain English already know that. So it's homologia tas hamatias. Confess your sin. The hamatias. Sin is still there. So it's homologia hamatias. It is not homologia Christos. Confess who you are in Christ. So the true meaning of Persian 1 9 is confess and agree with the word about what the word says about sin. So if the word says that certain thing is sin and the word says it's not sin, agree with the word, it's still sin. Have to be confessed. And the word keeps changing. Some things they are sin, they now don't call it sin anymore. And uh, like uh, people living together before they are married, the word says, ah, that's just living together. Uh, and all, all the same, the Bible speaks because it's sin. So, homologia hamatias is talking about acknowledging and confessing what sin is that the word calls sin. And then, when we acknowledge that the Bible calls it sin, I call it sin, so I must repent, I must confess, Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't see it to be sin. Now I see it to be sin, I'm sorry, forgive me. Then, that is homologia at work in 1 John 1 9. So, there's still the confession and acknowledgement of sin. Then after you're cleansed, then you can call, thank God for who you are in Christ, thank God he cleansed you from sin. Of course. So in the context now of Hebrews, homologia is, it just exists by itself. Whereas the one in 1 John 1, 9 is a, a word that pointed to sin. Now this one is a noun by itself. Is homologia. The other one is homologio in version 1 9. So, what's the difference? Now, its emphasis is on the actual confession process itself. That the whatever is spoken has to be lined up with the word. It is more like confessing the word. And there's no object that is pointing to, not like version 1 9 pointing to sin. Here, it just points to itself. This is the very substance of this confession. So Jesus is a high priest of our spoken word, if you understand. Our spoken word is in line with the word. And we, there are three times it's used in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. It says, Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. Again, you see the word holding on. Hold fast our homologia. Whatever is spoken of the word. So homologia, in a sense, is like the spoken word. That's in line with the written word. Hold fast to that word. And the next place, Hebrews 10, verse 25. Hebrews chapter, oops, my wrong scripture there. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, place that we want to look at it, not verse 25 here. <coughs> Hebrews 10 still, but it is in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession or the homologia of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Now it becomes clearer. For the first time, the first two times I said homologia, homologia. Now it's homologia our peace, which is homologia of your hope. 
if the object is the hope, it's speaking forth what you're hoping for. And the two are tied up. Now, here is the process of growth that takes place. There is a place where we are just resting and yielding and at rest and God is writing into us. The new covenant He puts into us and He writes into our hearts and minds. He puts into our heart, He writes into our heart. He puts into our mind, He writes into our mind. So we are receiving. Now as we receive, we need part of the process of receiving, being sealed, is you speaking the same thing. That is why salvation involves you calling on Jesus. Although in exceptional cases where a person cannot speak, there are other ways of expression, like move the finger or whatever, the thumb and arm or whatever. It's an indication. There's something, and uh, that person call on the Lord. Maybe it's the spirit inside calling. The physical body cannot call, but there has to be. For us, it's physical. For those who can, but if not for those who cannot express or those, those uh, that uh, only have brainwave activity or the inside they can hear but they, their whole body is comatized and some sort of way in which their inner spirit or their soul call upon God as you know there's an inner voice that person still has and, but some sort of expression and then for those of us who can who have speech speak it for in most general sense when you accepted Christ it involves your speech. The Bible says in Hebrew, uh, in the book Romans chapter ten, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, and that's how salvation is sealed. And the process of whatever God builds inside, and this is one of the secret process. If God has said something to you or put something inside you, some things are secret between you and God, of course. But when you begin to talk to God. So let's talk about secret process that cannot talk to anyone. Talk to God about it. Then you are acknowledging your receive. Because you don't have to pursue it, make it mechanical. God puts it inside and says, eh, 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 eh. Message received. Eh, 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 eh. Because, what's the message? No. Then you say, ah! Message not received. <laughs> <laughs> it is whatever God revealed to you you start a conversation with God it says God thank you for revealing these things thank you for showing me this and if I'm not receiving clear teach me more Lord teach me how this fits in your word now when you acknowledge it he knows reception is done and um, like uh, now sometimes people send you emails, hundreds of emails every day, so I cannot reply to all emails. And uh, sometimes I pass it on the editor, I mean reply. And so, so, so sometimes you know I say okay, you know, and you know, if let's say you got you got thousand friends and everyone send you an email, you got to reply to everyone, and then they receive, and the obligation is to reply, finish. Every friend you add, there will be always exchange, 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 right? So we all understand the protocol. That sometimes you sense the message and the person send back, then you know, you know, sometimes you just send show, thank you, and then the person the person can also say thank you, and I thank you, I thank you, no, I thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, right? So at one point the person says, yeah, I acknowledge, I know it's enough, you know, acknowledgement. Right. So uh, like you send the person a reminder, the person yes, acknowledge. Good enough, you don't have to you don't have to say, I now acknowledge your acknowledgement. Yeah. No. It stops there. Right? Something gonna stop the message to and fro. So in the same way, when God deposits something into your heart, He's actually looking for a response. Some sort of response. Some sort of acknowledgement that you got it. And some people get it by journaling. Uh, like you, you journal, then something, God uh, sees and you know, ah, He got it. He's journaling it. Or you acknowledge or the way you change your life. Like you send something to do and, and you didn't say anything, but your actions show you change the diary. Then you know, the, your guardian angel will say, Message received. <laughs> Since you didn't say anything, I'm so acknowledge me that. But 
there is some sort of homologue gear in you where you've, you've established it. Everything God places into us, we must acknowledge it in some way. But once you get into the pattern, they know you have received it. And then they can build the next one, the next message. And, then, and so it progresses in that way. And each time it changes you on the inside. The process of homologia. That this substance of your faith that God is building. Remember I say frame by frame. This is the process of hypostasis. One thing at a time. One thing that is received at a time. And any good quantity surveyor or any good contractor, and if you're building, you know, let's say 100,000 seating building, every process is important. And part of, uh, part of quality control is to watch how the process is received. Why is it that the bigger an organization, the more bureaucratic, and then only the top few know what to do, then the bottom all don't know? The process got broke down, broken down in a way. So that from the first person to the last person, you know, the message has been diluted and not implemented. And so to get the full process fully down, uh, we need to be able to read it every uh, detail and every portion uh, that is there. When you build a building, every process is important. You see buildings collapsing because somebody compromised on the cement. You know, cement also there's a right way to mix. And uh, when they build the, uh, the Twin Towers in, in uh, KL, and, uh, and when they build it, the foundation has to be so strong that at that time, uh, the Prime Minister was uh, Mahade, and, and he used his authority as a Prime Minister. He lined up truckloads of cement truck to come in at a certain time. Because the foundation, you know, if you've got lots of cement, it's going to take a long time to dry. And uh, then it has to be within a certain time frame. And uh, so as they were doing it, and you read about how the building was built, the foundation, that as they were building it, uh, they had the blowing process, and now they've got new methods to cool. Nowadays, the engineers are clever. They invent new methods to cool, you know, by, by inserting... Uh, things inside and actually pumping uh, cold air into it or, or, or freezing the metal so that when it touch the, the cement dries very fast. Uh, there were many, many things, many things that he invented, but the thing is that if you just dump a huge lump of cement on, on acres and acres of place, do you know by calculation it might even take years to harden? The outside might harden, but inside going to take a long time for the cement to harden. Uh, you read about the dam that they built uh, in, uh, in South America. Uh, I believe that one was what? Panama Canal. Oh, that was a, uh, also... And the engineers don't have the technology today. They're wondering how to get the cement to, to, to harden fast. So much cement needed. Or the Hoover Dam or some of these places. A great engineering fix. They got to think of new ways to make sure the cement harden within a certain time. Some of us think of oh, cement harden, why you only deal with a very small amount of cement? When you got megatons of cement in one place, the natural hardening process of acres and megatons of cement, the natural hardening process can take months to years. And the thing is this, you cannot build on it until it hardens. Because if you build on it, it's very insecure. So it's not as easy as we think sometimes, looking at big, huge buildings. They kind of overcome a lot of logistics and natural chemical processes. And so in, in, in that process, uh, they're going to think of ways to get it to harden uh, exactly, and ways of cooling, uh, and getting it hardened hard enough so that they can build a foundation, that it can be used as a foundation. And, uh, and if some things take months to harden already finished, your schedule is gone. You cannot do anything. And you never find them doing that in a building project where they just put a lot of cement and they say, oh, let's go, go back and come back in three years. They can't do that. A lot of projects, uh, need, uh, they have to make a turnover. The workers, what to do with workers, can't fire them, rehire them. So many logistics problems. In the same way, when God builds into our life, there is a process in which it's wet cement, then the cement must dry. 
and then you know it's absorbed by you. And in that process is homologia, the process of frame by frame is building into you as you hold on to the things. But this, this is the expression of, uh, of acknowledgement that we have received something in God. We talk about secret process first. You talk to God. Whenever God reveals uh, to me and shows me something, I say, thank you, Lord. And I begin to talk to the Lord. I say, God, what should I do about this? Should I get absorbed in it? And then, sometimes I don't have to talk to God. He just see me uh, begin to study in that direction. He know I receive it. He know that you know, I'm examining the revelation that He's revealing to me. And there are many ways that God really acknowledges. That's talking about secret things God showed to you. But talking about things that you could talk about. How do you know when a person has received something? You can hear from their normal composition. I'm not talking about official composition. Com People officially confess. Yes, by his stripes I'm healed. Hallelujah! And then you spend one, uh, one hour meditating. Yes, 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 by his stripes, yes, the word of God. Yeah, healing. And then all the word of God. And then, that is part of it. But God is also hearing. Like, after you finish, then next thing is, you know, somebody asks, hey, how are you? I think I'm going to die. <laughs> that is more important as much as this. Then the angels will report, message not received. <laughs> Whatever <coughs> input has been rejected, hasn't taken root, need re-input. I don't know how long some people take to get it into that. Which is why Chan Ji Fine, why when Chan Ji Fine was born and he came along, came to know Christ, why one man can bring a revival where many existed before him? Churches have existed. And he went to his church, in his local church, he brought revival. Why him? Because he told them this. And he said, I've been attending your prayer meeting for months. And I believe that you guys don't believe in your own prayers. They say, why? Because every time after you pray, you talk as if God never heard you. He is a very consistent man. And it's from his faith that God began to use. He chose him as a man that God uh, used for the second great awakening, from great revival. And it's important for us to understand that that process that is there, that we express, we receive, God and His angels are looking, hearing, looking at your actions, watching your emotion, watching every word that you say to see whether you have received it. Have you understood this truth you received? The spirit of truth is very heavy, absorb it. And you say, wow, then life becomes difficult. Remember we talked about being living in the Holy Holy Seventh Generation? Let me tell you what it's like. It is not just being, being not committing the ten sins or the ten, uh, ten commandments. It's not just talking about thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not drink, all the it's not just that. It's that you don't sin with your thoughts. You don't sin with your feelings. This is how deep it goes. Your soul has a rise in holiness. And you don't sin with careless words. Where before you don't live in the holy of holies, you just live in the outer court, you know, maybe you only judge on the outward actions. Then when you live in the holy place, Suddenly, you're also judged by your thought processes. The feelings that you're hiding inside you. The wrong desires you're harboring. Suddenly, this becomes like black spots. You begin to notice that. When you get into the Holy of Holies, holiness will convict you even if your word is slightly out of line. Doesn't mean that you cannot be free and joke all days uh, uh, and, and be relaxed a day. There's a, 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 a level to that. But yet, there's a level where we never joke and our joke contains unbelief. You know, we may banter one another in a, in a social way, but it will never contain unbelief. Because when you're in a holy of holies, unbelief is like sin. Unbelief is like stealing. That's the level it is. 
And the higher you grow into God, it, we see here in uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Is that it says here, talking about a tree and the treasures of your heart in verse 35, 36, 37. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things and an evil man out of the evil thing, treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word, not just a few, but every single one, and it's talking about just not normal words, even ideal words are unacceptable. Again, I say it doesn't mean you can't banter, socialize, or joke, but it never contains anything that is against the word. Homologia. That means it's still within the framework where you're still agreeing with God. God's word in that. And it says here, Every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in a day of judgment. By your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Now, in verse 36, isn't it very harsh? To say that, you know what we have to give account? They will give account of it. You thought that you're going to account for your actions? When you live in the Holy of Holies, you account for every word that comes out of your mouth. That, that level of holiness, that level, seven level, and not to worry, some of you say, wow, I got secret thoughts. Huh? There is a progress. Go don't expect overnight you get used to Holy of Holies. But there's a progress that you're making. And one of the good things is this. If you're aware that they are wrong, it's part of the process. And then slowly it grows until you're not just aware of it being wrong. You just can't stand it anymore. It becomes distasteful to you. You see, sometimes a person might not make a wrong action. But in your mind, they're thinking all the wrong thing. And they enjoy thinking the wrong thing. And you know, every day is an entertaining thing to them. But when you get touched by the Holy of Holies, the enjoyment disappears. Which is why I say the most miserable person in the world is not a non Christian. But the most miserable person in the world is a Christian who doesn't walk with God. Say, why? He got enough knowledge to know what sin is. But yet at the same time, he still walks in sin. You see, wait, isn't the non Christian worse? No, you know why? The non Christian are not convicted of sin. So they, their conscience is not working, everything not working, they really enjoy sin. Oh, sin, sin is so enjoyable to them. Every day they talk about sin like normal day. Like some sort of enjoyment. And they enjoy it because they don't have a conscience to trouble them every day. Their conscience died long ago. They're not born again. But you as a Christian, every night you get convicted. Anyway, so you're neither, neither there nor there in your misery. Whereas, if you're a Christian who walk with God, you enjoy the things of God. And you, you, you taste of joy that the world never gave. Peace that the world never gave. At least you enjoy that. But here you're a Christian who don't walk with God but is still walking in the way of the world. You're neither here nor there. And you, you, you got enough Christianity to make you miserable. But not enough Christianity to make you holy. That's the most horrible place to be. You either go all the way enjoy Christianity. Of course I won't ever get the other side. But you want to follow Christ, follow until you enjoy it. Don't follow Christ and say, yeah, why must follow him? Oh, why must he be the Lord? Why can't you know just be saved here? What kind of Christianity is that? 
And Jesus wants you to enjoy holiness. That's why holiness must become something beautiful. Beautiful is when you enjoy it. And that's where in this, as we relate to this, every word, every thought, every feeling. Now don't worry if you're not there yet. But the more closer you grow to God, the more He began to deal deeper and deeper and deeper. doesn't just deal with your action. He began to deal with the way you think, the way you feel. You say, why must God dig so deep? Until you become exactly like Jesus. So here's the thing. Does Jesus have any wrong feelings? very silent. <laughs> Even if you thought he has, you don't dare to say. <laughs> now, let's start with thoughts. Does Jesus have any wrong thoughts? He would have the opportunity to do the wrong thing, correct? So, the devil and the world around him would try to give him wrong thoughts. So he must at least feel them and hear them. Otherwise, it's not a temptation. So let's look at it differently. Jesus has to be tempted exactly like us. So to be tempted, you must have the wrong feelings. You must have the wrong thoughts available. Otherwise, it's not a true temptation. Right? When the, when the devil comes in time, Jesus doesn't feel like anything the temptation. It's not temptation at all. He must feel it. He must sense it in his thought. <coughs> it is not wrong to feel the wrong thing. It's just your soul need tuning. It's not wrong to have the wrong thoughts. Having them and feeling them is just part of being human. And being in this earth. But you notice something. The closer you get with God, sometimes in the midst of prayer, in the midst of worship, you're just worshiping. And you're saying, Glory. When you're saying glory, you're not thinking of committing adultery somewhere. You can't work because you're so captured by the by the by the things of God. So there are moments in your life when you touch the glory, you, you literally don't have a wrong thought or don't have a wrong feeling. Correct. What's going to happen is in the end time, more of it's going to happen. It's going to be flowing out through you until you're like surrounded by a bubble of God's presence. But now, the bubble is very thin. So let's say, this is your spirit, this is your soul and the whole platform is your body. Now, the bubble is here around your spirit. And then it needs to grow upwards bigger and bigger over your soul. But to grow bigger, your soul needs structural supports to support the bubble. And that's where God is renewing your soul your mind. So that some of the things you used to think before, you don't think them anymore, correct? You don't even think about those things. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure, very sure, none of you are right now thinking about how to steal. Right? You're not thinking, after after this worship service, I'm going to go eat one tongue mee, go eat the one tongue mee chitty, and then grab a few dollars, then go near the fried quartel man, grab a few dollars, you're not thinking that way. I'm quite sure of that. Because you have progress. And, but as you progress, there are other, other thinkings that might be wrong. That you didn't realize is wrong. And God slowly renews your thinking. And slowly you build reinforcing. And you, you won't even think of those things anymore. It really grows. You, you literally grow out of it. You grow out of your sin. You say, Whoa, how can you say grow out of your sin? I'm talking about sins of feelings and thoughts. I'm not talking about sins of action. Of course, some people are so weak, 
that they keep falling into the into sin in action and you ask them to give up overnight they can't so it slowly fades up things like alcoholism cigarettes things like that and they might take some people instantly they just lost the desire but not everybody is the same because every action behind it could be a thousand different feelings and a thousand different reasons why they make that action and they might need a lot of inner healing so there's we might do the same action but the act, the same actions might be created by different emotions or different structural mental supports and so everyone is different but in the end there's a renewal process where internally we wean ourselves out of it so talking about normally in terms of action you know you don't tell the thief you slowly stop becoming <laughs> oh, you can't do that so suddenly you can't, you're talking about action here you know or you tell a murderer you used to murder 10 people tomorrow uh, you try to murder just 9 la. <laughs> <laughs> cannot <laughs> right? so certain things they got to really quit you got to, otherwise you get arrested you know the, even the law of the land will come against it uh, certain things there's no winning I actually understand that but there are most people there are certain things that they can win out of the process and uh, it's internal because especially if your actions some some action whether personal say whatever is linked to your emotions and your mind and that might take some process and God I mean God God is not in patient God God knows every one of your emotional weakness or your mental weakness God knows you as you are and the sin God already knows the worst sin in the world. So, what is your sin added to that? You know, God doesn't hate you. He might hate your sin, but He doesn't hate you. Even the worst sinner, God still loves them. Didn't the Bible say what we were yet sinners, He loves us? So, when you are sinning, do you think God stopped loving you? No, never. He never stopped loving you. Even at your weakest point. But here's my recommendation. At any point where you're weak, even if you are falling to sin, you should be like Peter drowning. Help me love. Even if that's all you could squeeze up. Or two words, not enough strength, one word. Help. <laughs> and in your mind you calling to God. At least you keep acknowledging Him. And you'll find then after you get back on track. You know, some people, they sin and they repent. And then they, whatever, whatever, then after that, then they sin, you know, after a while, they don't sin, they fall into sin again a few months later. And they are, oh, oh, oh. but even though that is process, God is still working in your life. God never gives up on you. We are talking about the Jesus who Peter asked. How, how often shall I forgive my brother? Jesus said, 70 times 7. And this is one day. If we sin against you 70 times 7, you still got to forgive. Now, if that's the standard Jesus set for us, how high do you think God's standard is? How many times must you sin until God says, I don't love you anymore because I don't like you to be sinning? <clears throat> Never. Never. You can sin a million times in one day, and Jesus still loves you. Of course, he would rather you be holy. Remember, the question is not God's love. The question is whether you can be holy. And you can appreciate God's love enough to stop sinning. And here's where the key is you grow out of your sin. Because in a sense, although sin is horrible, it caused Jesus to go to the cross. All sin is like the childishness all sin is like a childishness. Wanting to eat ice cream every day, morning, noon, and night until your pink son dies. <laughs> it's just that the foolish nature in us. All sin, you read the Bible, all sin is caused by foolishness. All sin is caused by our, our carnal, childish ways. Didn't Paul call them carnal, childish? All sin is that. All sin is because we never grow up. 
Which part to grow up? Sometimes people are endless and they still say, it's your spirit and your soul. Your soul needs to grow up. Once your soul grows, this is the guarantee. You will never go back to sin. You actually can grow up until you don't like the sin anymore and lose all childish. Like some of us here, most of us here like ice cream, right? But you're not going to eat ice cream morning, afternoon, night, supper, and middle of the night, put alarm clock, wake up just to eat ice cream. <laughs> you're not going to do that even if you like ice cream. And some of you love durian. Right? You're passionate about durian. You could even know what kind of durian, which kind of durian. You're not going to eat it every day. You got a proportion. Maybe at one time you might have one. But you grew out of it. Every one of you love different things. What is sin and what is a habitual sin? A habitual sin is something that you like and you love very much. That's it. If you don't like doing it, you don't enjoy it, why should you sin? Have you seen somebody sinning and say, I really don't enjoy this? <laughs> when they say enjoy it, although it's a short enjoyment, and you like the short enjoyment, and you grow out of it. It becomes an enjoyment that is inconsequential because you have found other things. Now here's the reason why many people cannot get, into, get up or sin in the holiness. Because they got nothing to replace it. Sin is because you enjoy it. If, if it's not enjoyable, why should the devil make other sin look so nice? Eat, drink and be merry. So anything that is enjoyable, he makes into a sin. Excess. So no one, you know, like becomes a, a, a glutton uh, uh, of food uh, because they say, I actually don't like it, but I just, I just have to eat. Lah. Every time I eat, it's horrible to me. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, let me see whether you can give a glutton or bitter cup. Say, what is a bitter cup? That's the crumbly vegetable. It's really bitter. And we cook it in such a way, since you like food, we cook it in such a way it brings out its extra bitterness. And say, here is a truckload of it. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> you take one bite, ah, ah, you know, you'll be suffering to eat. No sin is like that where you're sitting, ah, ah, ah. it's never like that because you enjoy it. Now, here's the secret you got to replace the appetite with another greater appetite. That's all. It's as simple as that. When your appetite for prayer, your appetite for the things of God, your appetite for worship is so great that you don't enjoy those things. Suddenly, sin looks unattractive to you. That is how the end time holiness is going to grow. God is going to change us from the inside until our emotions become holy. And, like, for example, some of you enjoy God's presence so much, you have an appetite for God. Now, I'm sure Eddie now has an appetite for all-night prayer. You know all-night prayer, he said, Oh, I miss all-night prayer. <laughs> anyway, let me assume that. <laughs> then, <laughs> what do you say? Actually, not so. <laughs> I say, your ideal appetite of God. So that when you don't have it, you miss it. That's why you got an appetite. So, some of you here, you got used to good teaching. I'm not satisfied by it. Your appetite for the word has grown. You want the word. You go to a church service, they don't think, hey, hungry. You have developed appetite without knowing it. You develop appetite for prayer. So you used to pray long hours. And then you come for all night pray, pray long hours. Then you go to another church pray meeting, hey, 15 minutes, and they're praying supermarket prayer for all this. You say, it doesn't satisfy you anymore. Why? You develop a good appetite for the things of God. It's like once you have tasted the best durian in the world, if there is such a thing, every other durian is in your car. And uh, once you have tasted the best fried kway teow, every other is mediocre, or can me, wonton me, whatever. Correct. Everything is measured by that one. Same way, once you have tasted the things of God, 
and you have developed appetite, holiness will come naturally. It will not be a struggle. So I encourage you, you know, growing in holiness is not like some church. Be holy! Be holy! Not holy! I want you! <laughs> that sounds more like Old Testament. Jesus knew that never worked. How many whackings have the Old Testament people got and still never got it? You know how heavy they got whacking? In the wilderness, the earth parted and swallowed some of that. Boom! <coughs> they went alive. Do you know the very next moment they still rebel? Never. Most people he see the earth open, swallow up seriously. Well, better don't see him again. And that was over rebellion. The very next moment they rebel and say, Moses, you kill them. Hey, Moses didn't kill the ground open in the Korah incident. How can they be so hard? Because they're telling us something. You can beat people over the head, you can you can threaten them, they cannot become holy, I can tell you. Because holiness is an appetite you develop. When you bring up your children, well, second generation, you're going to have many children. <laughs> so that we can more third generation. Fourth generation, fifth generation. And first generation, if you're young enough, first generation, have more. Whatever. That's a lot easier. But never have a 24 hour watch guard over your children to make sure they don't sin. Everywhere. You know? So there's no room for your children to sin because you literally room them out, no possible choice. The day your children got freedom, I tell you, they will go and taste every sin they can. Because they are not sinning was produced by external thing that prevents them. Not from internal change. If they love sin, they will still love sin. You could put in prison a, a, a robber but you might not change him. The moment he's out, he's still robbed again. You only stop him from robbing, you did not change him from robbing. You think God is interested in imprisoning us in holiness so that there's such a thing as holiness jail. <laughs> See what's holiness jail? You cannot do anything but holiness. <laughs> God put you in jail for holiness. That you cannot do. No such thing! He has to change us from the in inside develop and be ties for holiness. And that's how children can probably be growing a lot. That's how every single one of you, no matter how weak you are, no matter uh, where you are, no matter how many sins you have committed, God still can change. Sometimes people change in one area, but other area they're still growing. God knows. God understands. But I have brought before you the answer that everyone can be holy. Given enough time in a proper, good environment, holiness can be nurtured so that none is lost. And everyone can grow into Jesus Christ. That is the perfect church. You think the perfect church only consists of 10 people? The end time perfect church is Probably billion over people. Every single one of them will be holiness. Can you imagine that? We will see it in our time. We will see the end time church walk in such holiness, not because they are forced to be holy, they enjoy holiness. And the holiness will radiate from the head of the house to the every every single mother, every single brother and sister, to the youngest among us when they just know a few things of God, God's presence has increased so much in our life so that everyone loves holiness. We will still live in a world filled with the, the, the evil, the antichrist, the false prophet, the beast, and all the evil, but we will choose holiness. The church will reach a point of great holiness. No one who is called Jesus as Lord and Savior will be unholy. That's how it can be. Because His presence is growing inside us. And as it grows, we grow more in holiness. Even that to the extent you say you can't help it but be holy. Because His presence can transform you. And that is how God is going to change each one of us. And it starts 
with you agreeing to the word. As you hear this in your mind, because it's the word, you say, the word, the word says it, let it be so. What is the best response? Learn from Mary. When Mary was told that she would bear a child, this physically is impossible. She said, how can I have a child where no, 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 no man yet, although she's engaged? Naturally, it's impossible. And, but, and then, I'm sure she doesn't understand everything. Mentally, she said, I cannot comprehend all this. But, she says, let it be unto me according to your word. That's a response we all should have. Every time the word says it, and you agree, your mind agrees. Say, I don't understand it, but if this is in the word, and this is what the word says, let it be unto me according to your word. And then, your feelings might not feel like it, but you tell your feelings, it says, no matter how I feel, let it be unto me according to the word. No matter what my situation, let it be unto me according to my word, according to your word. No matter what my choices are, I still want God's word, God's will. So let it be unto me according to your word. When this is our response, homologia is it. Homologia, your mind agree, your emotions agree, even though your emotions are not fully there yet. And your, your free, free will agree, even though your free will is weak, then God can start doing something. He can institute and structure the change from your inside so that your appetites are changed. This is the substance, it is growth. Natural faith is a gift. God puts a substance of Himself into us, and bit by bit, it is not we change ourselves, we can never. He in us changes us. All we have to do is welcome Him. Welcome Him into our lives. Keep welcoming Him into our lives. Keep receiving more and more of Him. And one day you turn around and say, Wow, I have changed. We yeah. have. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank You for the gift of faith. Thank you, Father, that we can lay hold on that which you lay hold of us. You start the process first, but we hold on to your process. Sometimes we hold on with trembling hand, especially when you bring us to something new. We hold on with trembling hands. But yet, I will only respond from our spirit from our soul, from our mind, from emotion is let it be unto us according to your word. When your angel tells us things, when your Holy Spirit tells us things, when you give us a new assignment, when you give us a new prophecy, when you give a new revelation to our life, though we don't understand it, our only response is let it be unto us according to your word. So that your word changes us. Your word establishes us. And Father, I pray for every single one who hear your word today. I know there are people out there who struggle with holiness, struggle with sin. I pray that today you will open eyes to see and understand that the path to holiness <coughs> is easy for everyone. As we develop appetites, and there's no more room for appetites for sin. We thank you, Father. We just make room for God until there's no room for the devil. We thank you, Father. We bless you. How simple the process is. So, Father, let the word go forth to transform lives. And this day, bring out and bring forth the glorious church. Bring forth a people who hear this word in the holiness. Bring them not just to the holy place, but to the holy of holies. Bring us all into the heights, depth, width of your love and your holiness. Until we are perfectly transformed in Jesus' name.
Praise God. Let's all rise together. Let's sing this song. It's not your strength. It's not strength in you. And he, uh, he helps you to stand in your life. When I am down And know my soul So weary When troubles come And my heart of the appetites for holiness the appetites for spiritual things and let it grow strong in this life so that it takes over our life and without even a fitting thought without even a conscious effort lo and behold we have been transformed by your holiness in us thank you father for this wonderful new testament that we live in. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Give him a good clap. Of applause.